Today, we're going to talk about high-intensity interval training, also referred to as HIT training. We're going to go into what this type of exercise protocol is, and more importantly for most of you is is this the supreme way to structure an exercise session to optimize your overall brain health and recovery, improve neuroplasticity, improve function, and really just improve brain health in general as we age? If you're new to this channel, I'm Tara, I'm a neurologic physical therapist. And on this channel, we talk about anything and everything related to mobility, health, fitness, and mindset. In the context of neurologic injury, with the end goal of empowering you with as many tools as possible to take ownership of your rehab and your health, to live an overall more active, more mobile, pain free, happier, healthier life. And all that said, today we are going to talk about HIT training. But before we go into that, let's just talk about exercise in general. I cannot stress this enough before I even start this video that any exercise is better than no exercise. So if you are currently doing no exercise at all, any movement is good movement. You do not need to watch this video any further. It doesn't really matter whether or not you do HIIT training or some other form of training. Movement is medicine. So anything you do has plenty of evidence that suggests that as little as even one session per week of moving your body has positive impact on brain and overall health. But if you're someone that is already exercising regularly, you might want to know, is HIIT training superior to what we would consider like continuous training. So first, let's just talk about the CDC guidelines. So the CDC recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of high intensity exercise. Now, when they say moderate intensity or high intensity, they mean that you're maintaining a certain intensity level. And we'll get into what that means in a minute here, but that you're maintaining that for the duration of the exercise session. 150 minutes of moderate intensity means that roughly you would have to do that three times a week, that exercise plan three to five times a week for 30 plus minutes. Or if you were doing the high intensity exercise that you would need to do at least 25 minutes, three times a week. Now, in addition to that, it is important to know that an ideal exercise program also includes balance, flexibility, stretching, and resistance training. Very, very, very important. Resistance training is absolutely, absolutely essential to overall health and longevity. But we're just going to focus on that one component of an exercise program that the CDC talks about as far as that continuous cardiovascular or endurance training of the 150 minutes or 75 minutes per week. HIIT training would kind of fall into that category. And what HIIT training is, is you transition or you switch between high intensity exercise with a rest period in between. The high intensity component is 90% of your heart rate max, 80 to 90% of your heart rate max. The rest periods are anywhere from 50 to 60% of your heart rate max. Now, how do you measure your heart rate max? I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm going to give you a simpler way to kind of gauge your intensity. But big picture, this is a very gross number, not very specific, but it is used quite frequently, is 220 minus your age. 90% of that number would be 90% of your heart rate max. So 220 minus your, your age is your max heart rate. 90% of that would be high intensity. 40 to 60% of that would be the rest periods when it comes to the HIIT training protocols. Now, there is an easier method to monitoring your intensity that is pretty widely used and does have some validity, and that is rate of perceived exertion on a 20-point scale. So a rate of perceived exertion, 20 would be you're going all out. You cannot go any harder. You're at the highest possible intensity that you could go. Zero is you're completely at rest. You don't feel like you're doing anything. You're just lounging on the couch. 90% would be like 18. 60% would be about 12. So that kind of gives you an idea. And they do say that a 20-point 
scale versus a 10 point scale, zero to 10, um, does correlate somewhat to heart rate. So that's why it can be used and replaced to actually monitoring your heart rate. So just something to keep in mind if you do decide that you want to do this HIIT training or incorporate this into your training program. Now, as far as the time intervals, they can range anywhere from four minutes of high intensity followed by three minutes of rest all the way down to an even one-to-one where you do one minute of high intensity followed by one minute of rest and kind of everywhere in between. The point being is that you are going from this high intensity to this rest period and you're alternating. The protocols where they compare it to continuous training are anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. And the different modes are primarily in the literature are a treadmill or a bike. As far as what they used in some of the studies that they've done to compare HIIT training to continuous training. And I will say, just big picture at a glance for the general population, it does appear that HIIT training is superior for some reasons that are unrelated to health. So they have found that people are more compliant. They stick to these routines longer and more consistently because they're a lot more fun. You can do different types of exercise training. You can do them in groups and possibly a time factor. So you can do same amount of kind of exercise training in less time. Now, before we move on to more specific benefits of how HIIT training compares to continuous training, there are some contraindications or I would say precautions if you have had a stroke. Now, I'm going to talk in more depth about stroke, so definitely stick around. But if you have had a stroke, that is considered a precaution and you do want to get clearance from your doctor or your medical team before starting any type of high-intensity training. If you have a history of cardiac disease, also you would want to get clearance from your doctor. And ideally, you could um, have a stress test before for partaking in anything that requires high intensity training. Now let's get into more specific benefits when it comes to the general population. There are definitely some functional benefits that they see. So people that do this type of training uh, have increased gait speed and increased stride length, which are hugely important and correlated with overall health as we age, gait speed is. So for the general population, increasing gait speed is definitely a good metric to look at, and they do see that that is better, or gait speed improves with HIIT training when compared to continuous exercise training protocols. Now, some of the cardiovascular benefits, when they looked at people that have heart failure, uh, they see that there's an increased ejection fraction, meaning that with each pump of the heart, there is more blood being pushed out. And with when they've looked at people with metabolic syndrome, they see increased stroke volume, which is another measure of the amount of blood that's pumped out with each beat of the heart. Remember that blood is oxygen rich and hugely valuable to almost every tissue in our body. The other thing that they see is there's an increase in nitric oxide immediately following a HIIT training session. And nitric oxide is a uh, plays a role when it comes to relaxing smooth muscle. So if you guys have been following me for a while, you know that I've talked about the blood vessels and how that potentially can lead to a stroke. The blood vessels have smooth muscle in the wall, and that needs to relax when your blood pressure goes up to prevent clots, but just to really allow for efficient blood flow through your entire system. Nitric oxide is hugely involved in that relaxation of that smooth muscle. So it is one indication that your cardiovascular system is probably healthier or more efficient is that nitric oxide increases. And yes, they do see that after one after a session of HIIT training. Now, whether or not that can be applied to the cerebral vasculature, I didn't, that evidence is a little bit less clear, meaning looking at the blood flow in the brain if they see that same uh, result. Now, the other benefits that they see of this HIIT training, and I've talked about this before and I probably will continue to talk about it, but mitochondrial function. They definitely see improved mitochondrial function in as little as one session per week of this HIIT training. 
So if you want to learn more about my thoughts on mitochondrial function and how it is hugely important to look at if you are someone that's trying to recover from a stroke or you've been diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease, I will link the video that I, where I talk about a little bit more in depth on the mitochondrial function and oxidative stress. Highly recommend that you watch that video if you have not watched that video yet. And another benefit or another physiologic response that they see after HIIT training is that calcium uptake into the muscle fibers increases by 50 to 60% when compared to continuous exercise training. And this might play a key role in preventing muscle fatigue, meaning that you might be able to last longer before you kind of hit the wall. Now, when it comes to neuroplasticity or how the brain rewires based on new experiences, yes, they do see changes or adaptations in the brain after HIIT training. Some of the main things that they see are structural changes in the gray matter, which is the kind of like the cortex of the brain, and also in the hippocampus, which is hugely uh, implicated in memory. Now, when it comes to cardiovascular training versus HIIT training or continuous versus HIIT training, they see increased excitability in the cortical spinal tracts in the brain. These are clusters of neurons that go from the cortex to the spinal cord. So they take that movement that you're telling your body that you want to do, and it actually sends that information to the spinal cord for your muscles and your body to do its thing and actually execute that movement. And acutely, meaning immediately following a HIIT training session, they do see increases in BDNF. BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's one of four neurotrophins that are involved in cell growth. Now, along in the same category of neuroplasticity, and what's probably important to many of you, is that they have found that one bout of HIIT training after a motor training session increased retention. So when they compared a, they took someone and they com did a motor training session where you're trying to learn a new movement and immediately following that, they did a HIIT training session with someone and with someone else, they did a continuous training session. The person that did the HIIT training showed increased retention of that motor skill. So that would also indicate that there might be some potential increased benefit to HIIT training when it comes to neuroplasticity. All right. Now, most of that that I just went through was just literature on like the general population or really older adults is what I looked at more specifically. But now let's look more specifically at what the literature says when it comes to HIIT training and continuous versus continuous training when it comes to someone who's had a stroke. First, let's just talk big picture, what we know for sure without a shadow of a doubt, things that are important to just exercise in general. People that have had a stroke that just partake in some form of exercise after a stroke have decreased uh, stroke occurrence, meaning there is decreased risk of having a second stroke in those that partake in some form of cardiovascular exercise after the stroke. There is also sufficient evidence that people that do consistent cardiovascular training after a stroke have increased cognition and increased memory. They've also found that these individuals that engage in regular exercise have increased function. Now, I will give one caveat, even though I'm extremely biased to regular exercise after having a stroke, there are a lot of the studies that look at exercise protocols uh, have some inclusion and an exclusion criteria. And one of those cutoffs in a lot of studies is that someone needs to be able to walk without an assistive device. So I just question whether or not the reason they can claim that there's an increase in function is because of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for some of these studies. But nonetheless, I still do think that it is valuable to know that people that exercise have increase in functional recovery after stroke. And less studied or less concrete evidence, but still evidence out there, suggests that there's an increase or an upregulation of BDNF, that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, 
immediately following an exercise session in someone who has had a stroke. Now, how does HIIT training compare to just general continuous exercise after a stroke? There is some little bit of a bump up in some of the markers that they look at that can demonstrate some more neuroplastic changes in HIIT training compared to continuous training, improved cardiovascular function, and improved motor function when HIIT training is compared to continuous training. Now, what are the downsides to HIIT training when it comes to someone who's had a stroke? Well, one is is that it's really hard if you have gait or mobility issues to get your heart rate up into those zones. A lot of you I know use the new step. It's probably near impossible to get your intensity up to 90% of your heart rate max on a new step. So that is one downside to implementing this HIIT training. And then the other one is, is that it's an increased demand on the heart. So that would definitely be a potential risk factor to incorporate HIIT training into your overall training program. But that leads me to the next section, which is what does safety look like? Is it safe for someone who's had a stroke to partake in uh, HIIT training? And as far as the literature says to date, it, it, it appears safe. So there's one article that I will put in the description to this video that looked at a bunch of different studies and Collectively, the studies included like 46,000 participants, and there were two adverse events in that 46,000. Now, important to know that most studies, again, exclude people that are using an assistive device, which might also mean that it might exclude people that might be more at risk to having an adverse event in a lot of these studies, but it do, they do seem to be safe if you're just looking at the evidence. Keeping in mind that probably the more pe the people that are more at risk are probably excluded. So when you're applying this to your situation, that's one thing I would consider is that people that use an assisti assistive device to walk are excluded from a lot of these studies. But with that said, there are ways to further decrease your risk of having any type of an adverse event. One is definitely get clearance from your doctor prior to, preferably having a stress test prior to, if at all possible. The other way you can mitigate risk of having an adverse event is to be monitored. So having your blood pressure monitored, your heart rate monitored, and your oxygen saturations monitored can decrease that risk. If possible, having uh, an EKG done prior to, so just further looking at the heart rhythm, making sure that there's no serious issues there. If possible, being hooked up to a telemetry monitor. So a lot of you guys know that you, you were hooked up to a telemetry monitor when you were in the hospital. That just measured your heart rhythm and you kind of had that little machine you had to carry around with you. Now, one thing that was brought up in this paper that I read was that there is an increased risk for hyperperfusion damage or injury. So when you have a stroke, blood flow is cut off a lot of your neurologic injury was caused when blood flow was restored and came kind of flooding black flooding back into the brain for lack of a better term what that does is it sets off multiple cascades of events that uh, cause neurologic injury so there is an increased risk for this hyperperfusion when you get your body into these higher intensities where your heart's beating a little bit faster and working a little bit harder the suggestion to mitigate that risk. Obviously, one is timing. So they definitely don't recommend or there's really no benefit to doing this type of training in the first 14 days, which I think is probably a no-brainer. But just to throw that out there, some even suggesting up to 30 days, there's no benefit to doing any type of HIIT training. But the other suggestion was to ramp up the intensity during the high-intensity bursts over a course of like 10 to 15 seconds where you don't just, as soon as you, the clock hits zero, you don't just start going hard, but you kind of build up to that over the, the first 10 to 15 seconds of those first intervals. The other potential problem could be a hypotensive event that your whole, your body's ability to regulate your blood pressure might not be as efficient. And so after these 
bouts of high intensity, you might have a hypotensive episode. So to decrease or mitigate the risk of that, the suggestion is to do sitting rest breaks as opposed to an active recovery between the bursts, high bursts, high intensity bouts. And my suggestion, which wasn't really stated in the paper that I read, but my suggestion would be that you could get your doctor to refer you to a cardiac rehab program. So cardiac rehab programs, most hospitals have them. They're where patients that have had a cardiac event go for their rehab afterwards, where they build the heart back up. So they build the cardiovascular endurance back up. They are designed or these facilities are set up to monitor your heart while you are exercising. So they already have everything in place. So I think they're ideal. I think the reason why more patients aren't referred there is A, because the movement recovery is really important, but B, and so you'd probably go see a neurophysical therapist. But the other reason is, is that a lot of times people that have a cardiac event don't have a lot of mobility issues. So the cardiac rehab programs that I've seen or been a part of, the machines are really for people that don't have a lot of mobility issues. But in my opinion, that would be a quick fix of just putting in more modes of exercise to work with people that are lower level. But in an ideal world, to summarize all that and then of mitigating risk and getting the maximum benefit of exercise after stroke, in an ideal world, you could do like one day of cardiac rehab and maybe two days outpatient of neuro rehab. I think would be like the ideal balance. Now, when it comes to the different protocols that they've looked at after stroke, they range anywhere from two to three times per week for anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. These are the studies that showed some benefit to the HIT training versus continuous training. The protocols lasted anywhere from two to four weeks, and the time intervals were all over the place. One to one being very common and four to one being another common interval where you go four minutes on one minute off with the high intensity interval being 90% or 18 out of 20 on that rate of perceived exertion. Now, some considerations that are worth mentioning. You guys have heard me talk about learned non-use. You've heard me talk about just going to therapy every day and walk, 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 walk. And yes, I do think there's a downside to that as far as um, developing some stronger compensatory patterns. I've also talked in some of those videos that when you keep doing compensatory strategies that you actually get some brain changes on the uninjured or non-damaged side of the brain, which is definitely um, could potentially lead to more compensatory strategies, which I've talked a ton about on this video or on this channel. But the thing I want to mention is that when they looked at HIT training, when they do see the when they do report like improved uh neuroplasticity and the way that a lot of them measured that was upregulation of BDNF and structural changes in the brain. They do see more structural changes and upregulation of BDNF on the uninjured side, the contralesional side of the brain when for those that did HIT training when compared to continuous training. So something just to be aware of, not sure if it's meaningful information um, or if they need to do more studies on the types of training. So if they're just putting someone on a treadmill, maybe there's going to be more of a tendency to compensate. And that could potentially be one reason why you see more, more of those neuroplastic changes on the contralegional side of the brain, but definitely just something worth mentioning. Now let's talk about multiple sclerosis. First, let's just talk about the benefits of exercise in general if you're someone that ha does has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Without a doubt, people that have MS that partake in regular exercise have decreased disability progression, meaning you maintain your abilities longer. They also see improvements in overall cardiovascular health or the efficiency of your cardiovascular system. They see less gait and balance dysfunction, meaning people that exercise regularly that have MS maintain their balance and their gait abilities longer. Muscle strength and endurance is 
improved in people that have MS that exercise regularly. And the big one for a lot of you is fatigue and quality of life. So when matched, mild to moderate MS, mild to moderate disability with people that don't exercise and mild to moderate disability with people that do exercise, people with mild to moderate disability. So adjusting for disability, those people that exercise had better quality of life and less reported fatigue. So disability is the same. People that exercise have less reported fatigue and higher quality of life. Now the current MS uh, guideline for exercise is two to three times a week for 30 minutes. And if you want my opinion, I think that's the bare minimum that you need to do when it comes to disease progression, quality of life, and fatigue. All right, so that's just exercise in general. Now, when it comes to HIT training, they are pretty comparable. So there's not a ton of studies that have compared continuous training to HIT training. I only really found two that have been done in the last five years. But when they compare the two, there's really no statistically significant difference in cardiovascular function, core body temperature, which I know is important for a lot of you, that uh, whether you do continuous training or you do this HIT training, core body temperature was relatively increased relatively the same in both categories of exercise or both types of exercise. There were really no adverse events. However, from the HIT group, there was one subject or patient that withdrew voluntarily because they couldn't maintain the power output in the high intensity group. So My takeaway from that is is if I had to give a recommendation, I think that moderate intensity exercise is superior to HIIT training if you're someone that has MS. And here's why I say that, is that being consistent is really, really important. And I will say anecdotally what I see is that people feel more fatigued after a general general population. They usually report that they're more sore after a HIIT training session sometimes. And I think that that might decrease your ability to do it consistently. So even though it does, the studies or doesn't, don't show that there's any adverse effects to HIIT training, I do think mentally it's probably easier to do a moderate intensity continuous exercise form of cardiovascular training. But to summarize this entire video, I would say for general population, as far as aging and disease prevention and maintaining brain health, there is some suggestion that HIIT training would be superior to uh, continuous moderate intensity exercise training. When it comes to those of you that have had a stroke, I think it depends on where you're at on the disability scale, and what you enjoy. Honestly, if you enjoy it, do that form. I will be completely transparent. I am a moderate intensity, continuous training person. I like to just get out there and do something mindless and just maintain a certain intensity. If you like group sessions and you like varying up what you're doing, then HIIT training might be beneficial. If you're, you have less, fewer mobility issues, If you're someone that has MS, I would say I would stick with the continuous training. Now, next week, what I'm going to do is give ideas or suggestions of ways that you can incorporate HIIT training into your home program with very little equipment. So definitely come back for that video. And then that is it for this video. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos like this and you haven't yet subscribed, hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so that you'll get notified every time I upload new videos. If you want to get exercises throughout the week, head on over to Instagram and follow us over there where I post one to two videos every single week. If you wanted to go a little bit deeper, you can join our inner circle where we meet monthly live once a month where you can submit questions in advance and I answer those live during our live Q&A. 
You also get access to over 300 exercises uniquely and specifically designed for neurologic injury. And they're in a software program where you can organize them so you're not just randomly searching through videos on YouTube, as well as access to our Discord channel where you can ask questions throughout the week and throughout the month. I pop on there probably once a day. So it just gives you another opportunity to get some of your questions answered on a more consistent basis. And then that is it for this video. I enjoyed spending time with you all today and I will see you in the next video. Have a good day.